Good morning, everyone. We are going to call this workshop uh, of the Board of Regents of Del Mar College to order at 10 a.m. It's Tuesday, April 16th. Um, we're going to uh, establish a quorum so we can get started, although I do know that we have a couple of regents who are running late. Uh, Dr. Babley. <laughs> Here, he's here. <laughs> Mr. Garza. Here. Regent Averitt. Here. Mr. Krull. Here. I'm Carol Scott. We do have a quorum. Uh, we are expecting a couple more uh, regents shortly. Would you all, all please join me in a moment of silence? Thank you. And please stand as you join me in our Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please join us in reading the Delmar College vision statement. Delmar College will be the premier choice for life-changing educational opportunities provided by responsive, innovative faculty and staff who empower students to improve local and global communities. Del Mar College is um, streaming this audio and video in real time on our college's website. Uh, again, this is a workshop session of the board, uh, but we, do, we will begin with public comment. Is there anyone who has public comment uh, for any items not on the agenda? Seeing none, we will move uh, straight into uh, our uh, our business today. We're going to have uh, two related conversations. Uh, one is, uh, the first is going to be on our uh, upcoming strategic plan and, and the draft that the board has been provided in advance. Uh, and then second, we will talk about House Bill 8 and understand the metrics, some of the metrics involved in the new reporting requirement. Dr. Escamilla, are there any introductory remarks before we turn it over to Dr. Villarreal? Uh, very, very brief, Madam Chair. I, I just want to say good morning, everyone, and, and welcome to this, this uh, this meeting regarding our workshop regarding our, our new strategic plan. Strategic planning process is a is a is an ongoing, living, breathing kind of um, process at the college. It's it's uh, evergreen, and and uh, I'll just got to say that I just want to start off by saying to the staff, to the entire college, the efforts has been put put forth with uh, bringing this uh, process. Uh, to this level of importance, to this level of criticality, if you will, uh, for the college is is to be commended. Uh, lots of lots of hard work, and as we kick off this morning, it's a big thank you from my office and to to the team, um, and and congratulations to the board on on getting to this point. It's been a it's been a little bit of a trek to get here, so it sounds like we're on our way. Thank you, Madam Chair. Dr. Escamilla is going to vamp for 20 I'm seconds gonna, while the microphone I'm going to I'm going to sing for 20 seconds. Everybody close your ears. <laughs> Let's just wait to the till the battery kicks in there. Again, this is a, a, a great effort by the college and uh, I'm, I'm proud to say that your light is almost on is what I'm about to say. I'm proud to say it looks like. Yeah. There it is. There it is. Extra time that you that I needed <laughs> to kick started, uh, get kick started. Good morning, Regents. Dr. Bobley, I apologize, I can't see you right this second. We'll 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 make sure to fix that because uh, I believe we need to keep you awake this morning. Is that correct, sir? Yeah. Yes, a little jet lag, a little jet lag. But thank y'all so much um, for your time today. Um, really, our agenda is pretty basic this morning. Really want to recap the timeline and the planning process that we have all been through in the past year, and then to introduce the main components of the current draft plan, um, including some of the visual draft components that College Relations has been working on. So really today, I ask that we want to obtain your feedback so that we can proceed with the uh, finishing the draft of the plan and move on to uh, presenting it to you for formal approval in June or July of this summer and kicking off in August. 
This has been uh, our timeline. We are finally in phase three, or at the end of phase three, and we're reviewing the, uh, the draft plan right now. Um, the executive team, the cabinet will be receiving copies. Some of them already have. The strategic planning committee has been reviewing and editing as well with the same copy that you're receiving today. Um, and we really, again, want to refine this draft as simultaneously we're working with institutional effectiveness to really hone in on those uh, key performance indicators and KPIs so that we can really prepare for that final look and approval. Your board engagement, wow. So this past year, um, your engagement as a board has been so important for this process. You've received all sorts of information. You've received workshops on external trends, a legislative session. Uh, today, you're gonna have a robust presentation regarding House Bill 8 and how the college is moving forward. Um, and then we also did a really great workshop with Dr. Martha Ellis, where you talked about where you wanted to see the college go with the mission and vision and values. Um, and then I came in in the fall and we honed in again on those values. So I'd like to present those to you today. And then again, we will do final approval in the summer and launch this in the fall. So we're really excited. So there were a few key words that kept coming up um, with Dr. Escamilla, with VP Keys, with the board that we kept hearing. Number one, this plan needed to be bold. However, it also needs to be flexible. The content up front made me a little bit shorter, but still with the depth of the KPIs and data um, within the everyday processes of the college. So after the many focus groups with our internal and external stakeholders, we really began to focus in on what does the future look like for Del Mar College. And so what we quickly learned um, is these were the main priorities that came out from our external partners, our internal partners, our students, our faculty members, and our staff members. So as you can see, quick bullet points, there's a little bit of everything. So we decided these next five years were really going to be a new journey for the college. There were so many things that we already do extremely well and that we're extremely proud of, the legacy that Del Mar College has been for these past 90 years. But we also know that times are changing, right? Higher education is changing, our community is changing, the students who come to the college have changed. We've been through hurricanes, we've been through um, economic issues, we've been through major, major um, global pandemic. And so what we've come up with for you today is the draft of charting the Viking way. So what I'd like to do today is go over those major components with you because this is a very different looking plan than what you have seen in the past. And so I would like to review the components. I know that you've already had an opportunity to look at this, but it's gonna be really important for us to understand and go through because the details are a little bit different. So you have in front of you um, some really fun, fun, colorful items at your desk. You've got some note cards, you've got some stars, and then you've got the iceberg star apparatus there, folding piece that we will talk about in a little bit. Dr. Escamilla is holding it up. So let's start with that piece. Um, that is going to be your opportunity when we're going through the plan, as we go through the goals, for you to be able to show the group here whether you're seeing, hearing something positive, you wanna give some positive feedback with the star, or as we see the other side, are there some challenges already or those questions that you have regarding the different pieces of it? It's gonna be really important for us to understand and really capture today what you think are really, really good pieces to this, but other areas that you would like to see reviewed or revised. Okay. So starting with the components, again, very, very different. 
we have our standard vision, mission, and values that we're gonna guide you through. You've already seen these. These are the mission and vision and values that you uh, put together during the last workshop in the fall. And after going through them with the strategic planning committee, we felt that they really did, really did show what we aspire to be the purpose of the college and the areas that we're prioritizing. So before we get started on that, I wanna say a big thank you because you guiding us through this process has been extremely helpful because there's just a lot of information. So we're starting with our guiding stars. College Relations has really been helping us to capture, again, the essence of what the Viking Way is and charting the Viking Way. So our guiding stars are really those three foundation pieces of the strategic plan. Under each guiding star, you're going to have two overarching goals. These are the results that we want to see. And then under that, you'll see the initiatives and strategies, and they have verbs. They're action items. We want to see the action in those pieces. And then you also receive some of the alphabetical pieces, which are the um, really the detailed pieces, the operational pieces that you won't see every time we have a presentation, but just to give you an idea of where we're heading with our day-to-day -day processes. As we continue to hone in on the KPIs, you won't receive those today, but you will see based on the icons here in the plan, those measures are already in place. So for example, Del Mar College uh, is going to be um, assessing and counting some of those on our own. Um, but then we're also going to be using House Bill 8 and then the Texas Success Center Pathways KPIs to make sure that we're going along with the state strategic plan as well. Does anybody have any questions so far? Thank you. Our draft vision. Again, this is our aspiration. This is what we're shooting for, what we really aspire to achieve. We knew that we wanted this one to be a little shorter than the last one with some powerful words. And this is what came out of the last workshop with the board. Del Mar College empowers our communities to achieve their dreams. Simple, effective, bold. Do you want us to provide comments as we go? Yes, please. <laughs> I, um, in thinking about this, the, the word dream versus success um, is, um, I just think to achieve success to me would be a stronger statement than their dreams. So I would be anxious to hear um, why dreams was chosen, mm -hmm. and just if anybody else has any comment on that. But I just was thinking that, that success was a stronger uh, measure um, for our communities and our students. Sure. So one of the reasons that dreams continues to to come up for Del Mar College is that um, as College Relations has been moving forward with their marketing and their strategy, they've noticed that that is still in the community and internal a very strong component to who we are, Dreams Delivered, right? Um, we've moved on since then. We've had other marketing campaigns, but that idea continues to stay within the community. And so without completely bringing back Dreams Delivered, we did feel that this was an opportunity to incorporate that into um, our vision. Does anybody else have any other comments? Thank you, Chair Scott. Now the mission, again, according to SAC COC, our accrediting body, this one has to be a little bit more specific and a little bit more detailed, right? It has to show technically, right, what we do here at the college. And this is what you came up with in the fall. Del Mar College provides educational pathways that transforms lives, builds partnerships, and enriches communities. One thing to keep in mind is when we started the Aspire Achieve Strategic Plan in 2019, the board shifted to saying the vision during the board meeting. And so this is an opportunity to, for you to think about um, moving back to the original is usually reading the mission of the college. And so this is something that you could possibly switch to in the future. My favorite piece, 
We had such a fun activity when we looked at the values. So these are proposed values that came up from the last workshop as well. And again, these are the values that we are going to move forward as a college, you as a board, our faculty and our staff as we serve our students. This is what we're gonna prioritize. Integrity, courage, resourcefulness, community, empathy, tradition. Now, we don't have any definitions to them yet. Those are something that we're going to continue to work on these next few weeks. But what I would like for you to do now is an opportunity to put, again, some more personalization from the board onto this. So you have six note cards. They're all different colors. The color doesn't matter. Dr. Escamilla and Augie, I believe you have them as well. And um, our staff is going to have them as well if any of our committee, uh, uh, executive committee or cabinet would like to go ahead and fill their note cards out as well. I think this would be a really great time. So on your note card, on your first note card, if you will write integrity. When you think of integrity at Delmar College and within the community, is there a program that you think of here? Is there a faculty or a staff member? Is there a student that you've known over the time you've lived here in the community that really epitomizes when you think of what integrity is to you? And what does it mean to you? Good morning, Dr. Adame just in time for the fun stuff. Sir, do you have note cards at your, at your table? Okay. Is there anybody who'd like to share what what they wrote down for integrity from the board. I do. I think uh, Dr. Escamilla came to my mind right away. I think the presidential image and leadership in the community is very important. And I think he epitomizes uh, integrity. Uh, that's the way I looked at him even before I became a regent at large. So. Uh, he came to my mind first. Second is how the community views uh, Delmar College. I think the word integrity came to my mind because I always considered it had a lot more mm. internal fiber, uh, a conviction to contribute. Um, I think that speaks for the integrity of the college. So image, external image of the college came to my mind. Those two things. Thank you, Dr. Bobley. And Dr. Eskami, I know that's hard for you to, to, to hear, but you know, when we first started this process, Dr. Bobley, integrity was something that Dr. Eskami and I talked about because I've had the opportunity to personally see him make some very, very hard decisions um, that only a president can make. And integrity is always at the forefront. So Dr. Bobley, I agree with you, and I think many people would agree with you as well. If we move on to courage, when we, um, when we were doing the workshop here and afterwards with our team, the courage component came up with our students. So I wanted to give you an example from me when I think of courage. We had a, um, a student named Yaneli Diaz, and she was one of the um, parents, the focus group parents. And Yaneli has three daughters. She's married. Um, her husband has his own HVAC company. And um, last year was her last year before she was graduating here at Delmar College with her associates. When I had asked her to participate in the work group, I mean, in the focus group, she was so excited. But then I started asking her about her schedule. So I just want to give you a rundown of her schedule. She said, well, I, I work every day from 8 to 3. And then she says, I pick up the kids at 3. I take them home. I get them settled. And then I go to class Mondays and Wednesdays from 5 to 7.30. But I really, really want to participate. 
<laughs> and so we did. I don't remember how we did it, but we made it work. And so when I think of courage in terms of our values here at the college, Yanelli is a prime example to me of the person that uh, perseveres here. And it takes some courage to get here and to get through. So I'll ask you the same again with courage. If on another note card, if you will write that down and think of anyone or anything that, that reminds you of courage when it comes to Del Mar College. I'll, I'll just jump in there because I can't stand it, if I may, <laughs> with the courage. You're allowed, please. Y you hit the nail on the head with one student, but one thing that I've known is a hallmark of the, the American Community College is the courage with which our students as a whole come to the circumstances that we present to them in order to bring them through. It's in the literature, it's noted, it's been, it's been we've, we've experienced it ourselves personally. Um, it is indeed, that is such a pillar and a hallmark of the American Community College. I just, I just, I just love that one so much. And, it's, and I have students, plural. And so as uh, Dr. John Roosh would say, we are the college of fourth, fifth, and sixth chances. Sometimes it takes that many times to get the courage to not only walk up to the front door, but to get advised, to take the TSI, to take courses that you haven't taken in 20 years for some people, and to sit in class. And so, thank you, Dr. Escamilla. I, I was recalling his voice in my head from 1999 in about that same thing. Resourcefulness, across the board, um, we, we try every day, I see it here in this boardroom, I see it with Raul Garcia and his team, as we want to ensure that we are being stewards of the money that we receive. Um, discussions are heated at times, as they should be, because it is one of the main areas for the community college. We are our community college, we are our community, and it's very important for us to make sure that our finances really show the resourcefulness of the college. So that's just one example. I, I don't, resourcefulness means something else to me. It means being able to use your skill set to achieve your goal not necessarily the resources that Mr. Garcia and his crew deal with, but it's the internal being able to use mm -hmm. what you have to achieve what you want. That's, that's my definition of it. Absolutely. And I think sometimes you, don't, you learn that along the way. Yeah. You don't know that you have it until you're going through something. Well, and, and you, you change your skill set and change your goals as you go on in life. Yes, sir, thank you, that's a great example. I put, um, in terms of an individual, uh, Lenora Keys, because um, she, throughout her career with Del Mar College, has figured out innovative ways <laughs> to bring our internal resources and external partnerships to bear for uh, our students and for successive programs. So I think Lenora doesn't understand the words that can't be done because she always figures out a way to do it. That is absolutely <laughs> true. <laughs> and a great example. Amen. <laughs> I also, uh, Chair Cal, um, I was thinking of the, uh, the ability of the college to live through natural disasters and a pandemic uh, without seeking a pity factor or um, you know the external image of how the college struggled through and survived i think that shows a tremendous amount of resourceful you know resourcefulness to uh, 
to survive and thrive after that. Thank you for that, Dr. Bobley, for the faculty and staff who went through that, yes. the students. We wholeheartedly agree. <clears throat> now that we've had a disco timeout, <laughs> let's move on to community. When you think of community as a value and what we are here to do. One of, one of the things that's really Im impressed me in my, my year on the board is seeing who comes to these meetings and then seeing them out in the community uh, as a whole. And that, you know, a lot of colleges have a reputation of being an ivory tower. Mm -hmm. And the thing I've noticed is, is how many people from the college, professors, staff, students, are out involved in the rest of our larger community's life and how important that is uh, for the school and for the community as a whole. Thank you, and as we uh, go through the strategic plan, you'll see that we've included that this time around, Regent Loeb, and we really wanna make sure that we focus on that because it is an important part of who we are as a community college. I had to put in all departments, I mean, I, I think Literally every program and every department at the campus has some sort of community component to it, whether it's performance, whether it's invitations in, whether it's advisory com committees, uh, opportunities for folks to tour, to, to participate. I, I literally can't think of a program that we have where there's not a community component to it. Which is the right way to do it. We, we are solely here to serve the community. So um, thank you for that acknowledgement. We know that we still have a long way to go, that there's pockets that we probably need to focus on, but overall, when you do see our people out um, at events and um, you definitely see that um, we're out there meeting people and listening and talking to people. So thank you. Empathy, this one was a big one, Dr. Escamilla. I believe you felt this was one of the most important ones. This one's a little different because it, uh, it has that emotional component to it. But we've talked about what everybody's been through. Right now, I think in 2024, empathy across the board is key. Yes, sir, Regent Garza. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, I think for the students and the economic situation that, that they're in, the highest percentage of our students have economic challenges in order to be able to to participate in the educational, I'm gonna say system or higher educational system. You have to have empathy. You can't just do what you've always done because their challenges are different on a year by year basis. So you have to, you talked about flexibility as being one of the components of, this, of the plan. You've got to be able to figure out, you know, what, flexibility you can introduce or inject into your into your programs or into your counseling in order to be able to to show that empathy and to show those those students that that have economic challenges. Yes sir, thank you. Regent Garza, when it, when I uh, when I received my master's degree in counseling here at A&M Corpus Christi, empathy is the top pillar of the three pillars in in, in any kind of counseling. It's empathy genuineness, positive regard. Those are the three pillars of counseling. So you, 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 you were so right. And when you said that, I was just like, were you in our, one of my graduate classes with me? Of course, those kinds of things come natural to our, to our employees. Uh, and, and, and I'll tell you, it, it, every single day, there are so many transactions of empathy. I it kind of has a count, contradiction of sorts, but, but, but I mean it in the best, in the best mm -hmm. way possible. So many times, through the weekends through our evenings and so forth there are people that are just waiting our team is just waiting to receive messages of, of or requests from people out there needing our our help and so many times you know I can't tell you how many times I call Ms. Gracie Martinez anymore um, and Patricia before that we've, we've kind of handed that torch over to her and, 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 and so many times over the weekends during the holidays and the evenings and Leonard how many times have I bugged you on the weekends 
they will not stop. I say save this for Monday, but they do not listen to that part and they will reach out and they will help the student because they know the stressors that are upon those students and they, they are able to empathize with those students who are in that stressful moment and 48 hours more of stress to them is not acceptable. And they'll reach out to them over the weekend and just say, we're gonna talk to you, it's gonna be okay. And when you're able to do that and, and, and uh, have that level of empathy, it happens all the time in all of our classrooms with our faculty and our staff. It's just incredible. Mm -hmm. That one too, I mean, all of these, these are just so powerful. We Thank see you. examples of that every day at the college. And I'll give one example, uh, Ms. Letty Clark, who works under Dr. John DeHalcom. And um, her job is in the office, you know, looking at records, data entry, organizing, Yet, when a student walks into her office, she does not let them leave her office until she has got somebody on the phone and she has a name and, a, you know, where that student is going to go. And sometimes that can take 10 or 15 minutes that she sometimes usually doesn't have. But she is a great example of just the countless, like you said, transactions that we see every day just in regards to empathy. And the last one is tradition. I think we can't say Del Mar College without the amazing traditions that we have. Um, we have some that um, are no longer around. Um, and then we have some new ones that are starting to form. And so it's really exciting to work at an institution that is so seeped in legacy and tradition. It's fun to look at those old yearbooks or to walk into the Harvin Center and see all of the students, uh, student pictures. Um, I saw a Jags picture the other day on the wall from when he was one of the top students um, in, his, uh, in his graduating class. And so when you think of tradition here at the college, what does it make you think of? And we'll wrap up the values with this last one. Does anybody have any comments on tradition before we move on? So if, um, Regent Garza, did you have? Yeah, I just think for a community like ours, uh, tradition is, is important in the sense that, I mean, Del Mar College has a tradition of helping those students that have no other option of going somewhere else. The true, f the true fact is that so many of our community leaders, the people that are involved in the community, came to Del Mar College and graduated from Del Mar College before they went on to something else. And it had not been for Del Mar College, it, they wouldn't have had that, that opportunity to continue to grow. And so again, just recognizing, and we don't tout it enough, to be perfectly honest with you, that so many important people in our community went to Del Mar College and got their, their first start there. I think you're right. We've got some opportunities to really focus in and, and, um, and show all the wonderful alumni who've, who've come. Sometimes I feel it, it seems overwhelming for the college because so many people have come through, but I think to highlight really great examples of leadership here in the community would be valuable. Thank you, Regent Garza. So, so if you will do me a favor and hold on to those. Um, and then I will pick them up later. I, before yes, sir, Rudy Regent Lowe. Before Rudy spoke, I said, ben, I wrote, Ben, the starting place for so many of our local leaders need to point it out more. So. Thank you. So um, thank you for that. That was very helpful for us as well as we move forward to define the values. And uh, we'll go ahead and move on. If so, if you can, you can put your, those note cards to the side, and then we'll really start going into the structure of the proposed plan. So each of the three major guiding stars, communicate, elevate, and cultivate, have this underneath them. You're gonna have two overarching goals. And again, those are the desired results that we want the college to achieve, okay? 
And then underneath those two goals, each one will have two initiatives. Some of them will have three because we felt that we needed to add, um, you know, some areas needed some more robust initiatives and strategies. And then there are some examples, again, operationally of what we plan to do, and we're still uh, fleshing those out. Our guiding star number one is to communicate. Our community is so very proud of us and they want the world to know about it. So we plan to convey our message and our value by focusing um, on communicate as our first guiding star and really focus on initiatives and strategies moving communication forward. So in front of you, you've got your star and your iceberg. And so what I'd like for you to do now is we will go through this first guiding star, communicate. We will go over the goals. And if you have something positive to say, um, as we finish up goal one, if you can put your star so that we can know that you've got something positive to say. If you think you see some things that need to be reworded, reviewed, edited, or looked at again, some challenges, if you can turn and point out your iceberg and so that we can address those as well. We really wanna make sure that we capture all pieces um, so that I don't blindly leave here saying it was great. They loved all of it. <laughs> now you also have little star stickers. As you can see here, when we talked about the main pieces that came out of the plan with the bullet points, I have them here in front of you. So as we go through the plan. Yeah, I'm sorry, so we have this one. And I'm, we're gonna leave this one for staff to look at as well. Um, as you go along and you catch one of these pieces in the plan, if you can go ahead and mark it. We wanna ensure um, it's kind of our way of making sure that you can see and that we have included all of these elements in the plan. And if we haven't, we need to go back and look at that again. Does anybody have any questions about that? You can mark it on your sheet, on your paper. So for communicate, yes. <laughs> And for our staff, there's some extra copies if you would like a printed copy. In order to communicate, we want to collaborate across the college, so that is focusing on our internal communication, but then also goal two is to communicate and connect beyond the college externally. Page one of your sheet with your guiding star communicate. Let's take a look at goal one, which is collaborate across the college. That is our internal communication that we wanna focus on. We wanna do that by looking at initiatives that focus on internal partnerships, number one, and our communication strategies. And again, as you see the DMC icon, you'll notice those are the areas that the college itself, we will be monitoring, we will be coming up with thresholds and targets and counting that and making sure that we move that forward. So that will be for us to provide data on. Number one under internal partnerships is we wanna prioritize collective decision making. At the heart of who Delmar College is in the community, we pride ourselves on working hard to establish and keep our shared governance moving. So strategy number one is really prioritizing that collective decision making. But we felt that that also included our Board of Regents. When you are making decisions, are we communicating that to the college as a whole? When our committees, our councils, our work groups, our students are making decisions and it's moving through shared governance, are we communicating it well enough to all of our internal partners? We really feel like that's an area that came up repeatedly that we need to understand how to communicate internally so that everybody is hearing the same messages. Number two is engaging our leaders at all levels. This includes our assessment, campus-wide continuous improvement, strategic work groups and teams, aligning our strategic plans, 
so that we are all communicating and all of our strategies are staying connected. Yes, sir, Regent Kroll has an iceberg. Get us started, Regent Kroll. Well, in uh, number one, you included the students. And then when you engage leaders at all levels, I didn't see the students in there. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. you have a student uh, senate or whatever you might call it. Yes. Uh, that might be the focal point for engaging the leaders and the student leaders. Okay, that's a good point. Thank you. We will definitely add that in for discussion. Um, you're right, when we were doing this, we were focusing internally as our faculty and staff, but we didn't think to consider the student leaders well, yeah, in that piece. Well, you have the students piece. in the prioritizing the decision making, but engaging then, you prioritize the collective decision making, but you don't engage the student leaders. Absolutely. Thank you for that, noted. And again, I think this shows the importance of all the different eyes on this. Um, we've done this with the Strategic Planning Committee last week. We've started talking to some, some of our cabinet members, our vice presidents. Everybody has a different, a different lens, and that's really what we're looking for right now. So thank you, Regent Kroll. Anybody else? Moving on is our communication strategies. Improving our student-facing communication is key right now. Um, we know that, um, and this is internally, Right? This is what our current students, once they get here, once they enroll, once they're engaged, the, we heard that there was a lot of different challenges in where they hear messages. We hear frustration from our staff saying, but we email them, we do this. So we know that we have some work to do there. Again, really changing how we look at things, becoming bold and innovative so that we can really improve that student-facing communication for their success. Yes, ma'am. On this particular piece, and I understand, I guess I want to understand the connection between what improve student-facing communication means and some of the strategies in, in, the, uh, in the rest of the plan. So okay. the, the, the message part of that, the, uh, I guess I want to understand where the, where the messaging is coming from. Because um, you, you, can, you can improve the outputs in communication so I just want to understand that whole line better. Because you, you can improve, you can, you can increase, I guess, uh, but tell me how you're going to measure improvement. It's, it's not about increasing the quantity. How are you going to measure improvement? Correct. So the, the timing of this really works with um, the new pieces that are coming online um, with anthology. And uh, Jeff, do you want to talk about that a little bit? because we really are for the first time going to be able to capture that as well. So I'll let Jeff explain that. So you talked about all the different inputs that students receive. And if you think about it in terms of, if you asked everybody who had student-facing communications to write those communications on Post-its and then put them all up on the wall, you'd see that we're teaching students probably not to check their email because there's so many communications, right? So how can we take these technologies, how can we take Anthology, Reach, or any automation platforms we have, match those up with the processes we have across departments, and then really refine the types of communications to make sure that students are only getting the communications they really need? Thank you. Because the purpose of that improvement is to help students navigate, persist, succeed. Yes. So, I mean, yeah, communication yes. for in, in and of its own sake is not the reason to do that. So let's understand why we're communicating right. and, and that this is ultimately about their achievement and success. Got it. Thank you. The other piece was enhancing college to employee communication. And we gave one example of announcement of changes. That's very operational. But just to give you an example of some of the areas that the college has asked that our faculty and staff um, have asked for is just an overall strategy on an initiative on, again, communication. We do the same thing. Sometimes certain areas send out tons of emails and sometimes our faculty and staff don't have, have time to check all of those. So again, really needing to focus on 
what we send out and the quality versus the quantity. So we'll be looking at that as well. Regent Goddess, did you have just a question? A comment? Yeah, just a question mostly. Um, prior to the pandemic, we may have been communicating in a different manner than we did during the pandemic because of the challenges related to uh, catching COVID. And so I'm just curious if we've gone back to continue to try to communicate the way we did pre-2019 and pre-pandemic, because there's some, I'm thinking there's some, there might be some students or faculty members or staff that feel more comfortable communicating, yes, articulating one-on-one -on -one or face-to-face -face versus the, using the different media platforms. Yes, sir. And you know, um, some of these pieces, the college in pockets is working on them, you know, cer certain areas, you know, are learning new ways and are implementing new ways. But the reason we put it in the strategic plan is we felt that this was important overall to address it as a college you know, wholly, so that the entire college, every faculty and staff member, every department, every program is communicating effectively with each other. And so, yes, some of our areas, right, are being, are modernizing and doing things differently. We want to make sure that we capture that across the college. So, um, excuse me. Yes, sir. How do you, I mean, um, is there a data-driven aspect to this? I mean, are you going to gather some data to measure effectiveness? And we're talking about in general terms, um, how to increase communication, how to be effective, but we have, to, is there a data gathering aspect to that so that we can constantly improve uh, on that communication strategies? Yes, sir. And that is where internally we're going to have to start keeping track of this. And so, for example, if you look at um, strategy two under engaged leaders at all levels, strategic work groups and teams, there are currently work groups right now that are focusing on those pieces. And it really is, Dr. Bobley, very operational on the day-to-day -day level. What can we do, you know, that checklist, number one, we need to do this, we need to work on this area. Who is going to be responsible for it? And then really making sure that it goes all the way down to the day-to-day -to -day so that we are seeing a difference. So yes, it will be up to the college to count those things. This part is going to be different than you'll see in the Elevate piece where we're looking at Texas Success Center data and coordinating board data where we're going to be able to use thresholds and targets, right, to really measure. This one is, these, this data is gonna be different. Okay, thanks. Uh, I think too, um, focused communication is also a good idea. I mean, in my previous life, I used to get emails all the way across the board, and half of them didn't appeal, didn't have anything to do with my function, but I was still getting them. And so that's where your your e email inbox gets clogged. And so I think there needs to be some also some focus, but on the flip side of that, if you focus it down too far, then something that somebody else is doing or communicating may have some input to you and you don't know about it. So there's, it's, it's a pro and a con thing of how, how you set the limits on sure. who gets what emails. And I'll, uh, I'll give you a great example that we keep talking about emails. So um, I have a 20 and a 17 year old and what I have learned in the past few years, I had this aha moment when my son was applying for uh, colleges that they treat email like snail mail. Yeah. They don't check their email every day. This child had been admitted to a university for two weeks and had forgotten to check his email. I won't name names. And so, <laughs> um, he's Eric's son. And so, Eric's um, son. <laughs> and so, again, we, as this group, our generation, and you know, there's several generations that use email. I can't imagine not checking my email every day. These are the examples that we're talking about is that the smartphone, right? 
um, using AI, really using our data and innovative ways, using our technology to enhance. We've got to get better at this. Times have changed. And this is the college's opportunity to prioritize that. So really, to conclude under Communicate, our first guiding star, the idea is we want to collaborate across the college, prioritize and engage with our internal partners, and improve and enhance our communication. Let's move on to goal two, which is now connecting beyond the college. This is where um, our uh, college relations uh, marketing plan is going to come in very strongly. Um, we're going to focus on our marketing initiatives beyond the college, our partnerships within the community, and then here's the one, Regent Loeb, that you alluded to, is that service beyond the college. We're so excited about that because we did recognize that there are so many things that are happening from the Board of Regents to all of our faculty and staff at the local, state, and national level that we really need to start capturing and acknowledging and seeing how much time and effort the entire college is putting into that. Yes, ma'am. So I realize that under marketing initiatives, enrollment marketing, A and B are not the only things that you're going to be doing, that there's going to be many more things that are involved in enrollment marketing. Um, so I think helping the board as this particular initiative evolves, helping us understand uh, and connect, because um, that pipeline of enrollment, while a Achievement and success is ultimately uh, what the community expects of us and certainly what the state does now with outcomes-based funding. Uh, getting students into the pipeline is going to be really important. So and I know there's more to come, and I think the yes. board would be anxious to see uh, enrollment marketing and, and really understand that full fleshed-out plan. Absolutely, and you'll see that within the next couple of months. Partnerships within the community. Um, we heard from our community partners very strongly. They know tons of us. You know, I think, I think one of our community partners says, I know about 50 or 60 of y'all, but I don't know what each one of you does. And when I have a question, who do I call? You know, they're like, I can't always text Dr. Escamilla, but who do I text? You know, and so that is something that we're currently talking about and working on. And what does that mean? We have so many different areas of the college. You know, do you want to ask about the art department and the, you know, the upcoming play? Or do you want to talk about process technology and what's going on at Windward Campus? There's so many different things, but we know that we need to focus on streamlining that communication. And then the other fun part that we want to start doing is bringing the community to campus. Now, with the opening of Oso Creek and the Tres Grace Room, that has really opened up a lot of opportunity to bring people in, and we've heard some really positive feedback from the space. So thank you for allowing the community to come in like that. That has been extremely helpful, but we want to grow it, which is why it's here in the, in the plan. Does anybody have any stars? Yay, Dr. Escamilla. I, no, it's okay. I just, want to, I just want to show you I had a star. <laughs> they're, they're all, I, I'm just, I need to refrain because I'll drag us up. Okay, think about one. I'll come back to you. <laughs> Dr. Bobbley? Um, I don't know exactly Sorry. Um, so, um, you know, when you say bring uh, the community to campus, mm -hmm. Uh, it's, it reminds me of uh, the Indian American community here uses your facilities. I mean, the college facilities, you know, um, either some uh, festivities or some festivals and uh, dramas and you know, cultural activities. That's a great way to pull in ethnic communities onto the campus. And I think we should encourage that and publicize our availability because uh, you know, coming from uh, another university locally, um, my background, you know, it was a struggle to even book and request facility uh, to you, you know, to be used by these ethnic communities. You know, a lot of times uh, they didn't care. I mean, so some institutions don't care. But I think Delmar always acted in positive way of welcoming these communities. So I think we need to really cash in on that, encourage them, uh, so that they can feel at home here and later on use, you know, our college to send their, 
you know, for relatives and children to, uh, to attend the college. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. So this is a yes and. Thanks. Um, it's a double. Is it, well, no, yes, it's a double. Um, <laughs> so piggybacking on what Regent Krull said earlier, when we talk about service beyond college, I think there is a, a, a strategy that could be added in um, um, bragging about our students. Um, mm -hmm. So helping the community understand not just service, but where our students are succeeding. Um, and and I, that obviously plays into marketing, but I just think there, there are so many success stories and helping the student, helping the community understand who our students are today. Um, so we won't necessarily see our students volunteering out in the community a lot because so many of them are going to school part-time and working full-time and parenting and other things. And so we might not see the service aspect of some of our student organizations that four-year institutions might see. Uh, but I think the opportunity to show what our students are doing uh, is a service to the community and a service to the college. So I, I don't know how we could, maybe that's not the right place for it, uh, but somewhere in there to brag about uh, what our students are doing. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Viking volunteers have been around for a long time and they're still, they're still plugging away. We still see them cross the stage with their medals that they receive certain hours and so forth. It's a tremendous opportunity to project, not only have them do what they're doing, but then to, 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 to capture that and, and project it in the community. And I think also that's an opportunity for college relations to really use social media um, to really get that out there and to focus on that. So thank you. We'll, we'll definitely note that. I want to I want to go back to enrollment marketing. OK. And just one of the, one of the things that we saw at uh, at, at our conference in Las Vegas is uh, L L.A. County and school districts and LA County Community College are working on opt out dual credit where I mean I, I think we we may have a conception that we have to convince people to sign up rather than just working with their high schools to sign them up you know where they're where they're signed up automatically and then our marketing becomes mm -hmm. here are the classes you can take here's what you can do during the summer here's what you can do after school mm -hmm that helps you get where you want to go, not just marketing on become our student, but sure. go beyond that. Thank so. you. I know that is something that you continue to champion. And so you're right, with the growth, um, with House Bill 8 and the FAST program, there are definitely some opportunities for us to look at. Can I also go back, uh, yes, please, sir. if you don't mind? Uh, service uh, beyond the college, um, I think we should, somehow uh, bring in the, uh, the vision statement of Del Mar College because we serve local and global communities. So we don't have that. We have local, state, national, but we don't have global. I think we should add that because you know the pandemic has taught us that that we can be of service uh, to the world at large. Uh, nursing college is, is a very good example. Uh, nursing, you know, the school of nursing. Our program in nursing is a valuable asset to Del Mar College to globalize our community in that aspect of having partnerships and be of service to the world at large. And I think we can do that through our immigrant resources in the community and and our college vision as such. Thank you, Dr. Bobley. So that was guiding star number one, communicate. Guiding star number two, which is page two of your piece, which is elevate. So what we have learned through this entire process is that our day-to-day -day at the colleges, our processes and procedures um, are sometimes outdated. Um, that along with this new funding model that really modernizes how we look at the workforce and how we are funded as a college, we know that we have to elevate what we're doing. So really what you see with Guiding Star 2 
is a focus on our academics, our teaching excellence, and also our ability going back to being stewards of public dollars. So interesting, we had academics first, and Dr. Escamilla said, in any time you're starting something new, the first thing that the military does is start communication. And so we decided to put communication as our first guiding star, but elevating and our, expanding our programs of excellence really pays homage to the rigor, but also the quality of education that Del Mar College has always been known for. But we know, again, that we need to elevate because of where we're at in today's world. So if you look at initiatives one and two, in order to elevate, we want to expand our programs of excellence. Those are our academic programs. So we're going to focus, number one, on teaching excellence on our faculty. But then also, two, is on our student success. And you'll see under this guiding star, you have a multitude of KPIs from Texas Success to House Bill 8, and then also our own Del Mar College KPIs that we'll have to start focusing on. Alan, student, su student success, I guess, I guess the increased completion is very broad. Concept, I mean. Uh, it is, you're right, and strategy is just increasing completion. So that is gonna come in those three main areas. Okay. So that's why we've divvied them out. We've got our stackable credentials and degrees, transfer and dual enrollment. Those are kind of your three big buckets that we want to look at when it comes to increased completion. And most of the House Bill 8 metrics are going to fall here under completion. So we've added all of those in. Those will be counted. But if we take a step back to onboarding from entry point programs, those again, we divided that up into the three buckets of the population of students that we really felt that we needed to focus on. Our developmental education students, our dual enrollment students, which is what dual credit was in the past. Dual enrollment is now our credit and our continuing education students in high school. And then our adult basic education, which is our GED and then also the ESL grant which we're waiting to hear back from. So okay. as you see, when we look at student success, it's a lot because for the first time, our strategic plan is focusing on all students. So again, if you're coming in as a dual enrollment student, taking a high school course, if you're coming in wanting to get your GED, if you're coming in and you want to transfer to a top tier one university, we are going to focus on increasing completion. And that's really coming from House Bill 8 in those metrics. They're, they're, it's time that, again, we're, we start looking at everybody. Dr. Escamilla? Sorry, there's an iceberg to the left of you. Sorry. <laughs> it, it's just it's questions, and so I don't know. Yeah, it, I don't disagree with anything that you're saying, but I have a question. <laughs> Um, on strategy, so student success strategy one, you, you deal with those three buckets, but is there a, I don't see a bucket for um, the average student, for the, the traditional student. And so- Correct. I, I know we're gonna take care of all students, but, but is, tell me why there's not something in there for the traditional student. When we looked at entry point programs, we looked at those programs where students are coming in from different sideways, you know, mm -hmm. sideways, this way, coming back. And so that's why we decided to focus on those main areas. Those are the students that we have the most challenging when it comes to getting advised, making sure that their TSI complete, their developmental education courses. If you remember from our last um, um, meeting, I reported on our numbers for developmental education. We know that we have to start prioritizing that group. You know, 70% of our incoming freshmen fall under developmental education. And so we know we need to focus on that population. Mm -hmm. So we hadn't, but we, we have had that discussion with our steering committee that should we also go ahead and put in, like you said, that student 18-year-old just coming in. So we'll definitely think about that as well and adding that in. I'd just like to focus in on what you're on your state and about 70%. Um, that means that they're in at, at least one class. So I'm just tightening up yes, that statement you. a little bit. 
It doesn't mean that they're that they fall entirely necessarily. They have at least one. At class. least one course that they yep. need to take. Yes, sir. Thank you. So this is really something that our academic side of the house has really been excited and focusing on because it's looking at all of the hard work that we do with the Pathways Institute. We have a large committee. In fact, we just had a group go to, where'd y'all go? Round Rock to the uh, Pathways Institute. We were waiting for them to go to see the new uh, KPIs coming from the state regarding that. So they just got back, so now we can start filling in those new KPIs. Um, in, re in regards to the student success, because they have changed a bit. And now that we're really understanding, you're gonna hear about House Bill 8 from VP Keys and, and uh, Dr. DiVetta, you'll see that we're gonna start incorporating them and making sure that they fit into the plan. Maximizing the resources entrusted to the college is goal two. With any community college, again, our mission is to serve the community, and we have to be good stewards of the money that we receive. And so uh, Mr. Garcia and his uh, business team really came in and honed in on some areas that they wanted to focus on um, in regards to making sure that we are maximizing our resources. So the initiatives that they wanted to focus on are financial stewardship, um, our student facing resources, but then also through our physical resources ensuring that we're maximizing our spaces and keeping our facilities master plan updated. So as you can see here, there's lots of different areas um, under financial uh, stewardship that we're gonna focus on. Does anybody have any questions about that? The technology piece, the IT piece, is, mm -hmm. should that be in there as well? Yeah. It's not a physical resource, but or is it? I'm sorry, I'm, I was look, I think I got off where you were looking. I'm just looking for where do we talk about technology and uh, where, where does that show up in so, resources? Actually, with technology, we did focus on that in uh, the previous um, under cult, I'm sorry, under com communicate, I'm sorry, connecting beyond the call it. I'm going, I'm going too far back. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, one go it. back, sorry. Uh, which we did include technology there under teaching excellence in terms of the classroom. But so in terms of we, overall use of technology, so it, it's, there's instructional technology, but then the technology is the backbone to our to everything else that we do. Is that a resource that should be called out? I think so. I think it's definitely a good point. On, and it, I'm, go ahead, I'm sorry. please. On the... Uh, I'm not sure what connecting to external funds means, but one thing I noticed that's missing is uh, we do have a fair amount of business partners who pay tuition for employees to come here, and that's not really mentioned as a funding stream or as a, as a source for accessibility for students, you know, that, that we need to encourage more of that. Regent Loeb, are you referring to, uh, for example, corporate services? No, I'm, or? I'm, I'm, I'm talking about, you know, companies who have a company policy where they do tuition reimbursement ah, or tuition scholarships reimbursement. To, okay. or, or scholarships to their sure. employees to come here. And we don't really mention that directly anywhere on here. You're and right. It's not mentioned directly. We do have public-private partnerships, but as we get down into the KPIs, that could be one of our key performance indicators that we focus on. So that's, that's a great one, thank you. Yeah, thanks. You'll notice here that we included the foundation. A lot of our, in Regent Goddess on Loeb, I believe y'all were there during the stakeholder meeting. A lot of our external stakeholders felt that our foundation really needed more support from our industry partners. And we know that our industry partners already do give quite a lot to the college and to the foundation, but they'd like to see more. And so we're hoping to work with our foundation um, here in the next few weeks to really talk about what that means. What does that look like? Again, how do we add to already a robust um, foundation uh, policy and procedure with that? So stay tuned to that. Does anybody have any questions on that? What does under strategy number two, or uh, the student facing resources uh, number two, what does early alert supports mean? 
So a lot of that, again, goes back to our student-facing resources and being able to communicate things specifically to them um, early on about what is available to them. And so um, that coordinate the use of information sources is really connecting them to all of the information early on and making sure that they're getting those alerts. Did that not make sense? Basically intervening before they fail the class. You know, when, when the professor first starts seeing that their grades aren't doing well, intervening them rather than waiting for them to fail the class or stop coming to class. Okay. Thank you, Regent Loeb. I think you said that, that better makes than I sense. did. <laughs> <laughs> And I know you didn't have your iceberg raised, but I could see it on your face, Regent Kroll. Does anybody have any questions on Elevate? I've got, I've got a comment or question, I guess. Um, in terms of elevating, are you talking about also elevating basically this, the achievement of the student in a shorter time period? We talked about wanting to get them to get some sort of either certification yes. or credential yes. or, you know, ready to get transferred and go, go to upper level, another uh, higher college. But I think that I, I view education at Del Mar's and even the school districts as one educational system. And I think that's what the state intends by putting out all these carrots for HB8 and trying to get it get us to get our young people to to get to enter the workforce maybe sooner than rather than later with more uh, skills or yes sir college college uh, uh, and that does that goes back to um, elevate under the uh, under student success increased completion that's why we're looking at all those different areas because House Bill 8 is really pushing that completion piece. And so we know that although we have to continue to focus on enrollment, right, and recruitment, we also now have to, to really focus in on that. And so you're right, those are the different pieces here. The stackable credentials and degrees, right? If you're a transfer student, if you're a dual enrollment student, we're gonna focus on those completion rates. We need them to complete. Well, the, the challenge that we have is that historically, We've spent a lot of time and effort. You talked about 70% of basically upskilling the student population coming in. They're not re they're not ready for sure. For some of them aren't ready for college work. A lot of them aren't ready for college work. I see a deal there, or a comment in the communication piece that says uh, increasing communication with K through 12. Mm -hmm. Right. I don't know where it came from, but it. It's mm -hmm. there, it came from the community. Yes. Some of, some of the goals, community goals. Yes. And I still believe that there's not enough of the mainstream students or the our average students participating in the dual credit program, even though we made it free going, dating mm -hmm. back going into the fall. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's not, in my book, it's not necessarily just economic, it's also them not being, or feeling they're prepared to do college work. And that's really why we prioritize dual enrollment here under student success. That's one of the three main buckets that we're going to be looking at and working with uh, Dr. DeVette and his team as they oversee dual enrollment. And that's for credit, Regent Gaza, but it's also for continuing education, dual enrollment as well. As we said, the different pathways. Okay. Thank you. So we've gone through two guiding stars. Number one was communicate, two was elevate, and our last guiding star that we want to focus on is cultivate. It's been almost nine decades since the college opened its doors, and there have been so many changes in those 90 years, right? Our society has changed, our culture has changed. Higher ed has gone through some major changes, and most recently, I used to really love hearing when Regent Sandra Mesbarger would talk about her time at Delmar College, right? It was a very different time. There were dorms, um, there were socials, there were sock hops, uh, there was the Buck Days Parade with the crowning of the king and queen, the football team went to the Rose Bowl. Again, Delmar College looked very different. And so we know that 
um, our faculty and staff have um, shared with us and they've been very clear that it's really time to cultivate and to really make some new connections with our Del Mar College faculty, staff, and student family. Um, COVID definitely played a part in that. I think there were some areas that were already that we needed to focus on, but after the pandemic and coming back, the, um, the different stakeholders have really honed in on we need to increase and cultivate where we're at. So under cultivate, we want to look at two major goals. In order to increase our cultivation here at the college, we want to number one, nurture our professionals to achieve their full potential. We know that when um, our employees are happy, when um, they're learning, when they're getting new knowledge, when they feel like they are making a difference, because that's really important, um, that they achieve and they go above and beyond. And we know that we want to do everything that we can as a college to really facilitate that. But goal two is specifically focusing on the student, optimizing the Viking student experience, and we're really excited about that. So let's go over goal one with nurturing our professionals at their full potential. In order to do that, the three initiatives that we're looking at are looking at high quality professionals, really focusing on providing professional growth and development, and enhancing those opportunities for advancement, which includes succession planning, leadership planning, and really providing growth for faculty and staff. There is already pockets of really great professional growth that already happens. Again, as the college grows, right now that we're three campuses and we have all sorts of different programs, we want to ensure that everybody at the college is receiving that. Wellness, safety came up as a big um, priority for our faculty and staff. They want to feel safe here on campus. We want to prioritize that and we want to focus on the well being of our employees. And so when we talk about that, we not only talk about physical safety, but we talk about emotional safety. And what great example of that is what our student affairs does in our counseling department. Um, if you recall last year, there were a couple of hoaxes um, of, of fake calls that, that came in and we were put on lockdown and when we put on alert, it was really scary. And what ended up happening is um, through listening to our faculty and staff afterwards, HR asked if we could have some counseling sessions to really help our faculty and staff get through it. And it was extremely helpful. So there was two or three different sessions. And so that's just one example, again, when we talk about the well-being of employees, as long as physical well-being. This, I have to say, is probably my most favorite. So if everybody could go ahead and get their stars out now, <laughs> I would appreciate that which is number three, the college culture establishing the Viking way. You've heard it, I'm sure if you're on LinkedIn, if you're hearing about other colleges and universities, that caring campus initiative, right, across the board is, uh, is being done in community colleges at four years, where we really want to establish that college culture of care and connectivity. And then we want to strategize the processes. We've got a new employees that come in and we wanted to be able to focus on making them feel connected as well. So we're really excited about that. Does anybody have any questions under nurturing professionals? Yes. Um, yes, sir. Oh. Yay. Sorry. So uh, this, this is a kind of nomenclature in terms of nurture or professionals. Can't we just say nurture our employees or nurture our faculty and staff? Because when you say professionals, I'm thinking of our alum or who we graduated as professionals. Um, okay. Uh, it's kind of vague because it just took me in several ways. What, what, what do we mean by professionals? So we're talking about our campus employees, right? We're talking about college employees. Yes, sir. Okay. So we need to change that professionals into something more clear, okay. um, college employees or faculty and staff. Um, that, that just came to my mind. Yeah. Yes, sir, thank you, but, definitely yeah. noted on that. Anybody else? I, I don't know if this is the right place to bring it up, but you know, we, we had a workshop that kind of talked about belongingness, and we've seen some data on student completion that 
basically shows that there's a very high correlation between how students feel in terms of belonging and whether they complete. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I hadn't thought about it until just now, but I, I would imagine that whether they're, whether the faculty and staff they connect with also makes a difference and, and whether the faculty and staff themselves feel like they belong is also an important metric to look at. But I, I don't know that we really are, we're kind of spelling it out partially in a lot of different places, but there's no specific one where we're spelling it out in this, in, in the whole plan. And I, I think that's something important for us to, you know, I, I think a lot of these strategies are addressing that, but we're not really saying this is a, a specific strategy we're following is to maximize that. Okay. And I don't know, I don't really know where to put it because it kind of cuts across all three. That's uh, no, that's that's a good point. That's something for us to think about. So as you look at your value statements and you define those, so potentially community and empathy uh, in terms of because those will inform the Viking Way definition, and so so that that, that sense of belonging, uh, sense of caring, sense of empathy could go into those value statements as well. Absolutely. Let's move on to, this is our last goal um, under our last guiding star under Cultivate, which is now focusing on the student experience. And so there's a lot of great things happening here that you'll hear about from our um, enrollment uh, management uh, strategies that are coming out um, from our student affairs team. Um, but in order for us to optimize the Viking student experience, we want to focus on these three main areas. Number one, student entry. From the time you either go online, call, step on campus, right? Any type of student you are, dual enrollment, continuing education, credit, CTE, we want to focus on establishing those first connections for all of our students and engaging with all incoming students. So regardless of where you're coming from, we want to optimize student entry for everybody. Once you're here, then we want to focus on your student life experience, your time here at the college, okay? Onboarding um, our student services for persistence, making sure that our pathways are really being optimized during the advising, and really preparing our faculty and staff to properly advise, here's the keyword, all students. We need to focus on making sure that our processes and procedures are lining up so all of our students are getting treated the same as they go through until they hit their niche, until they hit their area at the college that they need to get more into specifics. And then again, number three, the student supports through completion. This is where we recognize those milestones. Again, did you get um, a, a certificate along the way. We want to be able to recognize that on the way to your degree. Right now, we, um, we're talking about that, but it's something that we're really excited about to move forward. And then our last strategy is preparing our students for success when they complete, regardless of where you're going, um, through career services, through on-site testing for certain certifications. We want to make sure that we are following that student all the way till they're completely done and successful here at the college. Yes, ma'am. Two comments. Under optimize the advising experience, uh, in this, the KPI around all students may define this, um, but I, I'm curious as to the, I would like, when we see the expansion, what the word optimize means, because I've, we've, we've talked about the importance of advising and intrusive advising and inescapable advising, and so how how, do, where do, how, how does that come in? And, and so so seeing those KPIs, I think, is going to be important to help us understand uh, that piece of it. Uh, and then on preparing students for post-completion success, um, there might need to be an additional strategy that connects our students as alums to continue. So if so, depending on what mm -hmm. they complete with the first time, there's going to be op there's there may be opportunities for them to come back and continue. And we need to be the source of that continuing um, continuing learning process and potentially more completions for them. 
Thank uh, you. I yes. just want to reemphasize that last point. <laughs> Sorry, where go you ahead. go? No, no I, go ahead. I, I mean, we can get paid if somebody, you know, somebody does dual credit and then they come back for a certificate after they finish dual credit and then they, you know, we get yes. paid every single time. And so it would really behoove us to really stay in touch with our alums. So if there's something that we can do to get them to come back and improve and move forward, because I, I, I mean, our current business is basically helping people get ahead in the career that they've already chosen. I mean, for the most part, I mean, that, that's what a lot of part-time students are doing. And so making sure they're aware that they can come back and if we have something new and that means we have to maintain a communication system to get to them always thank you for that that's absolutely something that we need it that we need to take note of and what you're alluding to really is is a great way to really wrap up the next five years and that what we're seeing from the state right from um and from workforce from our students is that education is no longer linear right um, it's it's very fluid and it's very complex. So you're in high school receiving college credits. You're doing continuing education courses. You're doing credit courses. You go to work, you come back. You finish the certificate, you get your associates. Some people are reskilling after 20, 30 years. And so we have to be ready for that. The state has really positioned us that financially to really incentivize that we focus on all these areas. And so um, that is what the plan is, is really intended to do. Again, while focusing on really making sure that our processes and procedures are in place so that we can optimize our faculty and staff to get it done right. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, Regent Garza and I attended at ACCT a number of sessions on student wellness and mental health in particular, and obviously you mentioned that with the, um, the previous slide for professional development. Um, I'm assuming you all have talked about that, knowing, knowing you all, and I'm wondering where that falls here and if there is a way to perhaps elevate that element a little bit to okay. make sure that we're you know, again, COVID taught us so much, but that we're placing a priority on mm -hmm. mental health support or at least connecting those resources that may exist in the community. Um, Absolutely, and that's that a good students. example of something Student Affairs does extremely well, but again, we wanna make sure that we're strategically incorporating it across the college to all of our students. Regent Averitt, I think that would fall under number two, student life experience under uh, strategy one. Um, honoring the student experience, that's a student while they're here, and making sure that they have their student services for persistence. So we know that our students who know about the services and who use them, love them, they rave about them. It's getting the other students to recognize that the services are here on campus. Um, and Student Affairs tries so hard to make sure that all of our students, right, have all of that information. Part of it being in the plan is so that we can help support that for them. Thank you, Regent Averitt. Anybody else? Any final thoughts um, regarding the plan as a whole? Can, one question. Can we think big a little bit uh, in terms of intercultural global experience that mm -hmm. we need to provide our students? Where does it fit? Mm -hmm. So in terms of uh, possibly studying abroad, yeah, and um, bringing, bringing students other from students. Ab abroad, yeah, that sort of thing. I think that's Have, something we definitely need to consider and see if that's something we need to add um, and start focusing on here at the college. So thank you, Dr. Bob. We will take that into account for sure. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? I like that concept because e even if it, it, it could ultimately be a study abroad, but there certainly could be a broader community, a broader cultural uh, definition, um, maybe in expanding our area, our programs of excellence, but, but how do we integrate yeah. um, broader experiences under programs of excellence for those students that might um, have that interest or ability? Thank you, yes, that does take us to the next level of thinking big and bold and innovative. I like that.
So the next steps are to take um, the information that you've given us today and go back and refine um, some, of the, um, some of the initiatives and strategies. And then we really need to start focusing on our key performance indicators. We've already uh, started that process. So not just the KPIs from House Bill 8, right, and from the Student Success, Texas Success Center. There are other data points and KPIs that we need to be able to deliver to you every year to show you where we're moving. That's really important for us right now. So we're really focusing on those KPIs. Um, also, the uh, cabinet, our vice presidents, and our executive committee will also be refining and going through the draft as well. So we're re slowly receiving feedback from everybody right now. So the plan is to return to the board in, uh, in June or July after Dr. Escamilla and VP Keys have looked over the plan and give you the final plan with all KPIs, all information for final board approval. And then in August, we would have the fun party launching of charting the Viking way. Does anybody have any questions on that? I just want to say that I really like the way you all have crafted this. Thank you very much. It's, it's simple yet does touch on, you know, a number, if not all of the priorities that we've set over the last several months. Um, I think it's easy you know, to understand and methodical and just thank you to everybody who had a hand in that. Thank you for that because there have been so many people, um, especially Dr. Lucy James, Dr. Sydney Sambi, and then we've got a new person added to our group, Ms. Brittany Shooker, and also part of the, uh, the new team that's really been, every word has been wordsmithed at least 10 times. I can promise you that with Dr. Lucy James. So thank you, Dr. James, for that. I appreciate your time. Um, I hope um, you understand how much time and effort we've put into this, but um, I also understand how much time and effort you, we have put on you to go through all of these details and we really appreciate it. The next five years are so exciting. We have so many great things happening here at the college and we appreciate your leadership. Dr. Escamilla? Just, just, just one parting shot, we've touched on it just a couple of times next year. Um, yeah, next calendar year is the college's birthday, 90th birthday. So 1935 to 2025. So just, we, we keep touching on that, we, we, but we don't say enough about it, but this is just a little infomercial about that, so we'll, we're working on some things. Uh, so just stay tuned, it's an, it'll be an important thing. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Villarreal, and to your whole team. Uh, we are going to have a discussion on the first year impact of uh, House Bill 8, uh, and so we appreciate Ms. Keyes and uh, Dr. Rivera uh, guiding us through these new metrics. Uh, and I think it's important for us to understand these as we think about key performance indicators. Um, hot off the press, any introductory comments? Well, no, I, just that this, as, as the team is, is setting things up, um, HB8 is, has really gained uh, a lot of momentum um, coming off the last legislative session. And um, I think, in my estimation, we're about 98% of what we have in front of us uh, complete, uh, implemented. Um, I think there are still some small peripheral issues that are waiting to be funded, waiting to be sorted out and, and the like. And what I would say is to the team is to get ready. The legislative session is right around the corner and there is likely to be uh, more massaging, if you will, of the, of the piece of the legislation and probably most likely more changes to come. It, it's, it's got an, I think it has an evolution of about three to five years of, of establishing itself. That's my opinion. Thank you, Madam Chair. Hi, right, good morning, everyone. Great job, um, Dr. Variel, on that uh, great overview of our strategic plan. Uh, Today, uh, or this morning, uh, uh, Regents and uh, Chairwoman Scott and, and Dr. Scamilla, uh, Ms. Keyes and I will be providing an overview of House Bill 8 and an update on the impact of how House Bill 8 uh, has impacted Del Mar since going into effect September 1st of uh, last year. And specifically, Ms. Keyes and I will present you an overview of the following topics, which are to provide a, um, 
uh, oversight or uh, you know just a uh, update on the milestones of the Community College Finance Commission, uh, the previous funding model versus the new funding model structure, and then um, uh, Ms. Keys will go into the detail of the 17 metrics on how um, the House Bill 8 uh, is funding uh, colleges across Texas. And then uh, she will close up with uh, some continuing strategies and how we will continue to enhance the integration of House Bill 8 here at Del Mar College. So there are about 150 colleges and universities in Texas, and of this amount, uh, Texas Public Community Colleges accounts for about 50 uh, college districts. Uh, given the accessibility of Texas community colleges, the uh, statistics you have here in front of you here is that uh, a whopping 93% of all uh, of career technical students um, or, or degrees are awarded at a community college here in Texas. 68% uh, of Texas freshmen and sophomores actually start at a community college. I think that's pretty impressive in my opinion. Uh, I'm one of them, of course. I think Dr. E is another one, and many others here uh, today are uh, products of community colleges. 70% uh, of them are minority and um, uh, freshmen and sophomores in higher education. So it's a great list or compilation to remind us of the um, importance of community colleges here in Texas and the role they play within our distinct populations that we serve. And based on some recent data, the 22-23 statistical data, um, here at Del Mar College, uh, we have uh, or serve 86% are part-time students. Uh, we have um, uh, about uh, 50, almost 60% are female students here at Del Mar College. And then we have the, the whopping 75% of our students are, reside in Noises County proper. And 70% um, of those students are first time in college. And that's very important. I heard that over and over again of how we serve all students. And I think that's an important metric to refocus on how important Del Mar College plays here in the Coastal Bend. So I don't want to, uh, you know, I know there's a lot of uh, information here, so I'm going to kind of go piece by piece. The transformation of Texas Community College's finance model began in earnest in 2021 uh, during the 87th Texas Legislature that established the Texas Commission on Community College Finance via Senate Bill 1230. The Texas Commission on Community College Finance was comprised of 12 members, two of which we have here today, Chairman Scott and Dr. Escamilla. The commission convened in 2022 to understand challenges identify opportunities for improvement and assess the state's workforce needs. In October of 21, the commission provided its recommendations to the Texas legislature. In 2023, the 88th Texas legislature passed House Bill 8, which provided over $680 million in funding to community college for its implementation. Governor Abbott subsequently signed House Bill 8 into effect on June 9th of 2023, codifying an innovative new model to fund community colleges here in Texas. This new model moved Texas community colleges to an outcomes-based model that rewards colleges for awarding degrees, certificates, and other credentials of value. And uh, to the right of the screen, when it goes down to the 2023 year, as we, uh, as it's been implemented, uh, the rulemaking committee uh, was uh, was put together by Commissioner Keller, and um, and I happen to serve on the rulemaking committee. I'm a representative, one of about uh, ten representatives across Texas uh, community colleges that represents the rulemaking committee, and it was convened. And so on um, uh, early August, uh, we adopted the rules for House Bill Eight in uh, 2023. That is. And as we go forward, uh, the rulemaking committee has been meeting periodically to um, uh, just to relook and uh, uh, basically revise rules, uh, what worked, what doesn't work, uh, what needs tweaking, what needs refinement. And as we go forward, uh, those rules are continually to be modified and, and adjusted. And so uh, at this point, um, you know, we're going forward into 2024. And I can assure you that uh, the adoption is going full steam ahead 
uh, with uh, Dr. Keller at the helm and others that are playing a vital role in the House Bill 8 implementation. I just want to stop and say thank yes. you for your service on that uh, on that advisory committee. We we I know that's over and above all the other things that you do. So thank you, Dr. Rivera, for for representing us and community colleges on that. Oh no, you're most welcome. You're most welcome. It's a pleasure of mine to do that for us in the college and our community. So as we look at the model itself, uh, there's three distinct areas that I want to point out, and the differences uh, between the previous model and the new model under House Bill Eight. Um, and so you'll see that the previous model was an inputs-based model, primarily funded through contact hours. The new model under House Bill 8 is performance-based, it's outcomes-based, and so it's going to be looking at uh, the, uh, the way uh, we are able to have students earn credentials of value, degrees, associate degrees, certificates, so on and so forth. Second um, ideal that you see here is the um, uh, way that the former model uh, looked at uh, operational costs. It was primarily uh, through uh, local lowering taxes, property taxes and such. Um, and so that was somewhat inequitable in how things were distributed and how things were financed or funded for operation uh, uh, expenses and such. So under the new model, uh, it offers a base tier funding approach. And under this base tier approach, it ensures that all colleges have at least a minimum amount of monies to be able to uh, uh, undertake their operations and instructional operations. And then finally, we have uh, the third bullet here is uh, the way it was allocated. Uh, it was primarily based on a biennium allocation uh, period. Um, and then the House Bill 8 now, as we move forward to House Bill 8, it's more of a dynamic model, and it's going to be looked at or assessed more on an annual basis as opposed to a biennium basis. And that's something that's very important to understand because um, it's, it's, it's us getting measured every year going forward and how we improve each of those 17 metrics that Ms. Keyes will uh, talk about here in a few minutes. This graphic here uh, provides this a funding comparison under the former, uh, uh, I would say inputs, uh, funding model base for, uh, versus the uh, current House Bill 8 approach or model. And so Del Mar received approximately uh, $954,000 more in uh, funding under House Bill 8. Uh, under the former community college funding model, uh, the colleges received uh, the majority of funding, uh, as I said earlier, based on contact hour reimbursement. And again, contact our reimbursement are those hours spent in the classroom, and uh, the colleges would get funding uh, a particular amount of, of monies uh, for a particular types of classes. And so then they would multiply the contact hours times that uh, uh, amount of money, and then you would come up with a, uh, an amount of money that uh, uh, times the say, uh, total class, and you come out with a, an amount of money that uh, would be then allocated to uh, the college based on those metrics. And so uh, other funding received uh, was for core operations and for student success milestones, which is like uh, degree completion, transfer, and such. Under the House Bill 8 funding model, Del Mar College now receives its funding through dual enrollment programming, occupational skills awards, certificates, degrees, and credentials of value earned by our students. And I said earlier, credential of value is just any type of credential that can lead to a licensure, uh, workforce skills award, uh, that could lead to some type of workforce ready credential that gets someone uh, work ready and upskilled and reskilled and into the workforce as soon as possible. And we do that a lot through our degrees and certificates and such here at the college. Dr. Rivera? Yes. So our, our realize today is about that column, that green column, and how we, we get to all those, those points or the, those inputs. Correct. Um, I think it is important uh, to note that the FAST funding and our TEOG funding for our students has also been increased, and that doesn't show up here. So that no. shows up as tuition uh, for those students, but the state has invested those additional dollars as well. Correct. Um, so, so this is specifically about outcomes-based funding. Yes. It would be interesting to see as a comparison at a future point in time, what did that look like? How did Delmar College specifically gain in both FAST money as well as TEOG money for our students 
uh, and that's not today's question, but a future question. Oh, sure. No, we yeah. can certainly address that. No problem. And so there's uh, three uh, major buckets tied to our funding. Um, um, and then uh, one of them happens to be the FAST, as you'll see there at the bottom there. But we have our funding that's uh, allocated through the uh, high demand and value uh, areas, uh, funding that's based on our uh, 2023 academic year or the average of three years. Uh, and uh, what the state does is they'll take the highest of, the, uh, of that, uh, whether it's the average or the actual amount. And then they have premium funding. And again, we'll look at that uh, specifically as it uh, uh, goes towards economically disadvantaged, academically disadvantaged adult learners, and then the financial aid for swift transfer, otherwise known as FAST. Is that three-year averaging ongoing, or is that a transitional period? Yeah, you know, that's. I know that it was. It's, uh, it's kind of geared towards transition at this point. Dr. Keller has been very, very uh, supportive of all colleges during this transitional period, and uh, he's made a statement that says no college will receive less than they've they received in previous years. So that's that's more in transitional uh, as we go forward. But Dr. Schema, you might have some other intelligence to share if there's anything else that you've heard. No. So, but I believe that's 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 what uh, is coming down the pipe at this point. Our next uh, graphic here is adult learners. And just so we can define adult learners, uh, it's those individuals are, are age 25 years or older. And under the uh, House Bill 8 metric, uh, the college receives a weighted uh, funding amount of 50%. And so as we serve more 25 years uh, or older students, we receive uh, that weight, additional weight of 50%. Currently, the college uh, service uh, about 71% uh, of adult learners that are classified as 25 years or older under the credit realm. When we look at economically disadvantaged, um, this is defined as a designation that applies to those post-secondary students that receive federal Pell Grant. Um, and we receive, as a college, 25% weight uh, for those uh, outcomes, that uh, those students that meet those metric, or that metric at that point. Next, we have academically disadvantaged uh, post-secondary students that have not met the uh, TSI, or Texas Success Initiative. Uh, for those that may not know what TSI is, it evaluates uh, mathematics and English language and um, uh, arts and reading. And so there's certain cut scores that uh, designate a student to be college ready or not. And so for those that aren't TSI, um, uh, or that are academic disadvantaged through the TSI assessment, uh, uh, the college will receive 25% awaited uh, funding through that metric. And then we look at the FAST or financial aid for SWIFT transfer. Uh, you'll see here that uh, uh, and this is a great, great program, by the way. It serves both uh, uh, we'll say dual enrollment. It's actually for the credit NCE, what we like to call dual enrollment. And so uh, population, which are high school students that are in the ninth grade to 12th grade levels. And so it provides them at, uh, tuition uh, from the state at no cost. Uh, for those that meet these metrics, they have to be uh, uh, also educationally, uh, or I should say economically disadvantaged on free lunch, free reduced lunch, to qualify for this program under House Bill 8 or FAST, and uh, they uh, take courses in one of these uh, specialized areas, uh, which are bulleted there for you. Um, and so from that point on, uh, students pay no money for tuition. Um, and uh, of course, uh, you might recall the board actually upped that, and so now we actually cover all students, whether or not uh, they're economically disadvantaged or not. So we actually are ahead of other colleges in the state with regard to that act that the board so passionately uh, passed uh, this last uh, couple of board meetings ago. And we go to our last slide for FAST, uh, and this is providing you a snapshot of how many FAST students were served uh, in the fall of 2023. We served approximately uh, almost 2,700 students. Um, and then you look at the spring of 2024, uh, we're right, right under 3,000 students served under FAST. And it's broken out here for you um, for dual credit and CE, just so you can see that breakout, how that breaks out for both the 2023 and 2024 semesters. 
Any questions on this part before I transition off to Ms. Keys? If not, uh, Ms. Keys will pick up this and she'll transition on to the metrics that uh, I was announcing. Ms. Keys? Sure. Thank you, Dr. Rivera. Good morning, or is it afternoon already? <laughs> uh, criteria number one, let's see. Let me just say this r really quick. That, sure. that last slide at 2943, that melted down a little bit. There was actually a little over 3,000 at one point mm -hmm. after you certify and so forth. But that's, that's a record number. It is a record but, number. Yeah, I, I think we said that, but I, I just want to emphasize that. That is a big, big deal. And we've been trying to get over that, um, that 3,000 mark for a long time. We just came shy of it again, but uh, nevertheless, again, that is a record number. Very proud of that, and I have to say that I'm sure that the free tuition made a big difference, and the reach out that this staff did to all the area ISDs was huge uh, coming forward. So it's, been, it's, it's a major, major accomplishment. Okay, as we begin looking at the 17 criteria, we're going to provide some specific information as we move forward as to how the not, over $19 million really broke out into different buckets as we move forward. Criteria number one provides for reimbursement of $1,700 for a dual credit student who completes 15 semester credit hours in either an academic or career technical program. This gives the ISD and the college the opportunity to more closely engage in advising students to take courses in a more directed pathway that ultimately leads to an award. The college received over $1.48 million for over 875 students in this classification this year. Number two, Del Mar College has always been the number one transfer institution to Texas A&M Corpus Christi, and this further signifies the importance of the academic programs that provide transfer credit for our students. The college received almost $4.4 million for students transferring to all three Texas A&M universities. So go Aggies, right? <laughs> yeah, there we go. Item number three. The funding criteria further signifies the importance of agreements with other general academic institutions, or GAI, for co-enrollment with at least 15 semester credit hours. This is an opportunity to further engage with programs such as Viking Islander and Viking Havelina agreements as we've had in the past. And as you can see, one of the key things you're going to see as we move forward is that these hours need to be lending towards a more concrete pathway, which will benefit the ISD as well as the college and as well as our students, instead of students taking random classes, which they tend to, to do particularly in certain areas. Number four, the acknowledgement of the importance of licensure or certification in business or industry related fields is critical moving forward. As you see, this criteria is only for those that are not in high demand and only received a minimum of $1,000. However, the college is benefiting from the increased amount that is paid on high demand fields as indicated in the next slide. So I didn't want everybody to say we only got $1,000 because as you look at the next one. This is an area that the college has been actively engaged and as you see, it has paid off. The licensure and certifications to support workforce development for business and industry paid at the higher rate of $1,200 as provided almost $2.5 million in funding. The top licensures or certifications earned were HVAC, process technology, and fire science. Can we talk a little bit about how high demand field is defined or is being defined? Yes, I'd be glad to. Uh, high demand field is one of the areas that is still, I'm going to call it in flux, in that this is being more defined throughout the state. And the, the purpose is to become more locally focused or regionally, regionally focused as our business and industry needs so that the jobs that truly are the ones that our community needs to work for and we want to deliver. In the past, you'll see that most of our career technology programs have been completely aligned with Workforce Solutions targeted occupation list. And that really reflects the job market for this region. 
What's happened though, the state, and they're going to get closer, I should say, but, but the state has developed a statewide criteria of approximately 10 in-demand fields and then they looked at what would be more closely related to your region and they picked five more that would be more closely to your region. However, as an example, welding was left off, but yoga got on, okay? So, I mean, uh, <laughs> we're not sure how all that quite happened, but it does lead an opportunity for improvement. The state has developed a process now by which we can petition to have a, a occupation area added to the in-demand list, and we will do that. And so when you get to my last slide, you'll see those are the areas that we're going to stay highly engaged with the coordinating board to make sure that this become, becomes more uh, really reflective of what we need here locally. And all throughout the next slide, you're gonna see where we tried to list the top licensures or the top graduate areas or program areas that fed into these different criteria, some of those are, they're high, in, high demand here locally and they are high demand or high performers for the college, but not necessarily on the state's high demand list. And so that's a, com, you know, it's a confl uh, conflicting part that we just had to deal with this year as we, as we tabulated our numbers. But what we're reflecting are the accurate numbers that have been submitted to the state and the dollars that we received. So I think the petition piece is important for us, but I'm curious as to the regional, um, what, what region are we in? How did they define the regions? We are, I'm glad you asked that. I remember, it's, we are like, we are a separate region from Houston and the areas that really more better reflect, more closely reflect our type of work and our type of industry, and I think that's what happened. So it's they not workforce solutions regions? It, it is, is workforce solutions, solutions, but it's not, it's not college-wide. I mean, the way they broke up the colleges and the c communities mm -hmm. were not reflective, say, of Beaumont or the areas that have high industry. So you don't okay. see the same jobs as a, other parts of the so state. So I think that regional definition would be important for us to, to maybe advocate on in addition to the petition we'll, uh, we'll get, option. We'll get you that information because what they've done is they've taken all the areas of the state and reclassified or redefined the regions. And, and economically, workforce-wise, we're more closely related to Port of Houston or Beaumont or something like that where our job growth is, and those are not in our region. Yeah. That so yeah, that that's important. I, I would I would agree with that. I'd I'd also say that one of one of the dangers of also using even the local workforce data alone is that is what currently exists, not what may exist mm -hmm. in the future. And so I, I would hope we'd also advocate for the ability to locally designate some targets. So for instance, if there's a new plant that's coming in and we are creating a program, which is one of the things that we really focus on in, in our community involvement and in economic development, we in workforce can go and say, for the next X years, this is our local designation, so we get paid for providing workforce for the, those people who are coming in. Yes. O otherwise, it's just trying to catch up and there's no forward looking. That's so. included Excellent. in the petition process, correct? It in is. Merging. It, emerging is there, yeah. but in, it's going to be a challenge uh, in that they're still focusing. We can't get on the list for another year. They won't modify the list for another year, Gotcha. is what we're being told right now. Um, hydrogen is a great example. The number of hydrogen plants that are interested in our area right now. We're very, uh, we're very fortunate that our process technology and instrumentation and electrical programs all, all similar and we already have a lot of the skill sets there. Yeah. However, but they're not defined in that outcome. And so it, this is going to be the evolving part over the next year or two. So we might, we might have to game what, what some of our stuff is called so it fits one of the criteria that they'll reimburse for rather than what it really should be called. Yes, sir. Okay. I'd be really <laughs> interested in the detail around that because we're having the conversations at the at the CAT legislative level, the TAC legislative level right now, and it's broad-based, continue working on implementation of House Bill 8, but we're going to need to address that legislatively. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Cause that's, that's what I was area. referring to earlier. That's the 5% mm -hmm. opposite of the 95% completion that I was talking about and the next legislative session. 
coming it, in front of us. It'd be interesting to see data on what our reimbursements would be if we followed our local in-demand job list versus what the state is saying it is. Or, or actually what, what one part of the state is saying it is versus what the part of the state whose job it is to look at that stuff says. So there's a lot of administrative wrangling going on with, with these details and so forth. And, and as an example, when uh, Chairman Workforce uh, Daniels was here the other day, I whispered in his ear, I said, I said, Brian, you got, you got to help me here. Welding is not in the bucket. He goes, what? In South Texas? Are you kidding me on the coast? He goes, he goes I said, look, there's a reason why but I just wanted to see what, you know, that kind of thing. He says, well, we're gonna talk when we get back to Harrison and so forth. And so we're, we're they're, they're all talking. We continue to meet on these um, things that seemingly stick out like a sore thumb. I think they were very calculated um, for different reasons. I understand that, uh, why they did what they did. I don't, I wish, well, anyway, I wish they would have been a little faster with it. But again, we've got a year, we've got another year to work this out. I think, yes, sir. Okay, thank you. As we move to number six, uh, these two slides again show the comparison of the funding allocated to, I'm going to call them standard licensures and certifications, as compared to those with high demand with a significance difference that this delineates with the institutional credentials that are state or nationally issued, I mean, not state or nationally issued. The three highest awards for the college are nursing, nurse aid patient care, Occupational Safety and Health, or OSHA, and Transportation Services. And so this provided approximately $34,000. However, when you go to the, the high demand area, you're going to see that the college received the higher amount of reimbursement, of reimbursement for the credentials in high demand category, totaling over $410,000 for institutional credentials. All these all of these credentials are the state's listing of high demand fields and top for the college. The Occupational Skills Awards are key part of many pathways within the Associate and Applied Science degrees that lead to workforce related skills. This criteria aligns with the Texas Workforce Commission and with the Federal Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, or WEA. These programs and all require a set of minimum semester credit hours. One key benefit is that continuing education courses and credit courses meet the standards that are required. The three top ASA awards listed here produce a significantly higher number for the college. However, only accounting is on the state's list for high demand. <laughs> Not business management or welding. The state's list of high demand jobs is still being developed and does not necessarily align with the regional workforce solutions targeted occupation list or what is in high demand locally. Yeah, and remember high demand means from the employer standpoint, not yeah. high demand from the student's expectations and or the student's interest. Yeah. A little difference there. There's a nuance we talked about the, the, and I think it's worth mentioning. Right. Very much so, thank you. Yeah. Uh, the state has provided the opportunity to write, revise these numbers for 2025-26. Follow on to what Dr. Escamilla said. You know, in some of these cases, like a welder may go out and form his own business. And so that doesn't correlate to the demand that's maybe out there. And the same way with business management, I mean, a guy that's going into business for himself, whatever the skill set, wants some business management skills to be able to run his own business. And I think that needs to be recognized somehow. The, again, there's some anomalies that I think they're working the kinks out on, the, this, this very discussion I, I can recall this very discussion, almost verbatim what you're saying, uh, in, in the uh, commission meetings and the subgroup meetings, especially in the workforce uh, subcommittee. Um, so yeah, again, lots of uh, anomalies like that. You're recognizing what we've recognized, and we're hoping, again, that we iron them out in, in coming months. Number nine. The high demand classification again provided additional funding for the same types of awards. This area lends itself to an increased opportunity for the college to leverage moving forward. 
the accounting and HVAC programs are on the state's high demand list, which we can account for. Again, we can rationalize changing, not gaming. I don't like that word, Regent Loeb. Um, but we can rationalize adjusting Change. the curriculum as, as community colleges do. Um, now, if we had a gambling program of which colleges do, we could use the word gaming, but we're not going to use that word. Uh, but my point is that as we evolve and shift towards it, what the, the, the driver of all this, again, is high demand from the workforce as we focus in, smooth those things out, get more regionalized, then we have a bona fide um, reason to, to, to evolve and change the curriculum and, and, and move um, towards this uh, number 10 type of opportunity here. Yes, sir. Thank you. Number 10, certificates level one and two are stair steps or embedded pathways in the career technology, associate and applied science degrees, such as welding, cosmetology, and police science. These paid over $554,000 this past year. Also note that the next slide shows the increased amount for high demand certificates. Over 545 college credit certificates were awarded in 2023, with an additional 830 combined number of licensures, institutional awards, and continuing education. Both these numbers really total up to where we're going in the future and how we can get those more into high demand classifications. The college continues to benefit from aligning programs with areas that are in high demand and received over $1.7 million for certificates level one and level two. As you see, there is some continuation of the top level programs that produce the most certificates. When you're looking at the different classifications, of course, Welding, we did not receive high demand, but it is, our, it is one of our largest completers here at the college in level one certificate, and then level two, welding appeared too for the second row. So you see a lot of commonality in these programs, completions that keep repeating themselves. The college does not have an advanced technical certificate that is in, that is not in high demand field. Therefore, we receive zero funding for this category. But, but the good news is, is that there are four awards in this area in high demand. The advanced technical certificates have a prerequisite or a prior associates or baccalaureate degree that is required to even get into these certificates. So they are a very low number right now for the college. This could be another great opportunity to grow in the future. These programs are on the state's high demand list, which has to do with the long-term nursing care administrator and the paralegal studies. So these two areas already exist for us, and we can expand on those. Funds Excuse me. Yes, sir. Are there any plans to expand, or are we thinking of expanding? Well, we have two that already exist, and okay. so we would. It, it's an opportunity to add more certificates that are advanced. Thanks. But there is a requirement that students to get take these must have already completed a degree. Okay. Funds that were awarded for associate degrees are also broken down by more standard versus high demand. The $3,500 that is reimbursed for degrees provided over $2.8 million with the highest number in liberal arts, which is our largest graduating class. The college continues to receive premium funding for high demand associate's degrees at over $5.4 million for over 1,209 degrees, which was the average for the past three academic years. The largest number of AAS degrees are in nursing, process technology, and dental hygiene, in addition to the associates in arts and registered nurse education. You can see where those came from. The bachelor's degree. The lower funding for the bachelor degree is not offered. However, the higher one is. So the, this adds to funding for the relatively new bachelor's degree in nursing with 23 degrees awarded with over $102,000 paid for those 23 degrees. I, I'd just like to add, if I may, Lenora, mm -hmm. when we started the, the, when we put the investment forward for the bachelor of science, in nursing degree, you know, that investment was 
was not funded specifically. Yeah. How this evolved and so forth is, is just a, is, I don't know how else to say it, a beautiful thing because now the opportunity directly to come back and, and support, the opportunity to come back and support this degree financially from the state um, was, was a very important uh, conversation I had in, in Austin. And the, the opportunities are still in front of us. Um, we'll be bringing to you another uh, presentation in, in coming in, in, the very, in, the, in the very near future about that next bachelor's degree opportunity that, uh, that Lucy is over there rejoicing about. We've just, I, I'm, I'm just gonna share it right now. We just received approval from Sachs. We just got that, I just read that at about five this morning, a letter from Sachs that said that we've, they, we've been given their approval uh, to move forward with our, our bachelor's of organizational management and leadership. So, so that one will, will increase too as we go forth. So just, just a little side commercial, thank you. Oh, that's Yay, congratulations Lucy. to Yay, everybody. Team. Yay, team. That, that's a big move forward. Uh, and this is just another great opportunity to keep adding that degree. And then as the graduates grow in this field, it, this, this number is going to grow. So um, one question. Yes, sir. Um, what's the maximum number of nursing BSN that we can give every year? I mean, is there a projection? We have or capacity building? Yes, sir. We, we were targeting 20 to 30 a year, but we're still building that number. So that's an opportunity, actually, for to, to internationalize that curriculum because lots of demand for nurses from abroad, too. That's an international recruitment yes, sir. in progress, I hope. You know, could be. We'll think yes. about that. Thanks. Well, nursing is such an in-demand field. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> and this is a recap of uh, tying the big buckets together, as you saw in the beginning, of the, for the colleges benefiting from the new reimbursement formula as compared to the prior contact hour structure. This year, with many of the rules that are still being finalized, like we discussed, the college received approximately $1 million in additional funding as compared to last year. And if you look at a biennium, which we are now on an annual basis, but that is guarantee basically for another million dollars every year going forward. And you can see how the, how the big buckets come together in the 17 areas uh, combined. As we look forward though, we're moving forward with the college is focusing on many strategies to better align with the House Bill 8. Data has already become a major influencer in decision making and will continue to be monitored. There will be an enhanced focus on high demand areas and engagement with the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board to better align with our region. Communication internally with the academic leadership at all levels and stakeholders is recognized as key. And the college is prepared to respond to changes based on student and community needs. And this is an opportunity for any questions or answers. Yeah, I, okay, yes, there's practicalities here. You're now having to track 18 metrics. <laughs> How much additional staff have you had to add <laughs> to, to, to track great, these metrics? Thank you, Ms. Richa Kroll. That's a great question. When you think of it, there's 17 metrics, but the items in the beginning where we had academically disadvantaged, aged, and uh, financially disadvantaged, all that overlaps in all these criteria. It's been quite a challenge because every report that's gone into the coordinating board has completely been revamped by our data team. So this has been a tremendous amount of work uh, on the team so, to realign. So how much of that million dollars of, of increased funding was spent on the reporting part of this? Well, our existing team did every bit of it. So yeah, but was, is that some, something that they could have been doing something else on? They probably so, could have. They worked long, hard hours. So thank you for recognizing that. Yeah. I'd like to... Um, Understanding, and you and Leonard and I can have a separate conversation around the high demand field definition uh, so that it, as I'm participating in those legislative committees, uh, I want to advocate appropriately and accurately. Um, so I'd like to have a follow up conversation on those. Uh, I'd like to be in that one too. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. That'd be very helpful. We appreciate our leadership, I promise. I also think if, if, we, if we can find a way to concisely communicate this 
to our local representatives and senators that represent our region. I think it's important, not today, but as they go into uh, the election cycle and go into uh, the next legislative session for them to hear from us uh, the benefits and, and what we see as, as uh, good things that have come out of that and, and still tweaks that we'd like to see. So I think that that's an important piece that we understand and can communicate with them uh, the benefits so far. Thank you, I'll be glad to. I wanted to add, we were recently asked to share this information with the Bill Gates Foundation out of Seattle, Washington, and because they see this as a model to go nationwide, and they're wanting to help, you know, one of the big uh, pushes for the Bill Gates Foundation is to end poverty, and they see this as a way nationally to influence other states and how they're funding their colleges. So congratulations on all your work. Um. With respect to high demand employers, I'm, in my contacts through the construction industry, one of the areas that they keep telling me that they're having, having or will be having problems with is heavy equipment operators. Is their heavy equipment operators are aging out and uh, they, they feel they they ask about is there some kind of a program somewhere to train heavy equipment operators? I know it would be a quite an investment in equipment and capital, but uh, maybe sir, we have some, one. Some the, of our some of our partners may be able to. I'll jump in on it. We have one. Uh, we, okay. We do, and the equipment's all been donated. And we have almost every piece you, you would need within heavy equipment. And it's run by our corporate services and continuing education area. And it funnels through to our diesel mechanics programs. Okay. Mm -hmm. is, it, is it been pretty popular or? Yes, sir. And we just, we could probably teach more, but it is very popular. And, and it is a huge demand. There is a huge demand. Yeah. Well, I didn't notice that on any of the. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not a degree yet. Oh, it's, it's handled it's a, through the certificates. It's areas. just a certificate. Yes, sir. Um, I, I, while while you were talking, I went on work in Texas and put welder in and have quite the company list to hand to Mark that um, <laughs> he can maybe go get some letters from, you know, Bechtel, Tesla, Bay, Kinder Morgan, Aeroliquid, Steel Dynamics, Keywit, uh, yeah. and. A, dozen others uh, that yes they do actually need welders and they're in high demand but um, uh, you mentioned you know and one, one of the issues on this is that uh, it does incentivize us to streamline people's pathway to a degree yes, but uh, a lot of our students when they're starting out don't necessarily know what they want to do and I know we've had some programs in the past on this in the summertime when people uh, where students can come and, you know, do a day of this, a day of that. And um, I was wondering if we looked at expanding that so we can, you know, have them show up or start taking classes where they have a better idea of what they might like to do because they took, you know, the first class was the survey course where they said, oh, I, I you know, I don't want to do welding, I want to do process tech. And so, just want to get your ideas on that. Well, I love your idea, actually, of more in the summer or whenever we can engage students like that. We do reach out to particularly the high school counselors um, and all the areas that we can bring students on campus to see what there is. And to, we actually are engaging a lot with business and industry and representatives to go into the classroom to give those more real world experiences. But that is a big challenge. What we're seeing is this is this program is going to require more. I'm going to call it aligned advising within the high schools for the dual credit programs and really within our own institution to make sure that advising is more on target because the high schools are going to need to work with us to make sure the students are, are channeled or following their pathways better too. It's, yeah, because it's a big challenge. I mean, I know they have, they have some stuff in theirs from the state on you know, they need to pick a pathway and then, but I, and I've heard that what, you know, one of the issues on that is the students pick a pathway without knowing what the pathway is, right. start it, hate it, don't succeed, and then it's a problem. So I'm just trying to figure out a way that we can. So I think that goes back to Natalie's conversation or presentation 
about the strategic plan and the KPIs from the state um, that have to do with strengthening the pathways processes. Uh, okay. that, that's what you were referring to there. And, and, and that's why when you were saying that our plan is coming over um, in conjunction, there's just, you've got to think of the layering of our strategic plan. Um, well, let's say the state strategic plan, uh, now HB8 in combination with our strategic plan, we're, 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 we're thinking of that. And I'm, I'm trying to connect some, some things here. I need a lifeline here, Natalie, <laughs> just in case. <laughs> um, because I, I think that's the way it was supposed to be going, but I don't want to just speak to speak. I think I'm, I'm on the right track anyway. Yes, and that's really what, when we're talking about um, where the plan focuses on all different areas of students within the, each metric within House Bill 8, right, really addresses all of our different students. So really focusing in on um, what we've talked about as a college is those first kind of 10 steps um, when a student comes here to make sure that all those processes and procedures are aligned to get them in the right pathways specifically our advising model um, and advising and registration so that they're in the right pathway and then they can complete whatever that is. Yeah. So on our advising now, does, does every student have a faculty advisor and how many students does each faculty member have? We don't allocate that way. <laughs> okay. Uh, right now we have embedded advisors who are full-time advisors okay. in about eight different program areas. But all faculty are advisors. And so we have a hybrid model where you have a centralized advising, but then all faculty really advise in their own program areas. Okay. And particularly in your career technology areas, the faculty are highly engaged in advising because that's their major. That's their, you know, the students know they want to go that way. Uh, liberal arts is more of a centralized advising model that takes place in student services. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Bonus question, Dr. Turner. I just noticed, like, from just my experience through GP and my experience through uh, Far Bluff, there's a huge gap of information between counselors and Del Mar. Yeah. And students at the high school level are not having to pick a pathway. They're just kind of taking classes at this moment. And, but a lot of our freshmen are passing the TSI in reading and math, and they're able to take classes starting as sophomores. So by the time they're getting to seniors, they still are not picking a pathway, and they're just taking classes that count as dual credit for high school and Del Mar. And I see that as being a disconnect because I just know a lot of those students are kind of struggling and they're not, they're, I, I don't know, I just, I just have an issue with that. Just no, it's a huge, it's a big challenge and it's yeah. a challenge within the school district and within Del Mar to make sure that the students get into where the classes that they're supposed to be in. Yeah, it's a big challenge. Thank you. Right. Anything else? Okay. <laughs> I turn my light off and then I turn it back on. Uh, I think that, yes, getting the information, like you serve on the EDC yes, board, sir. right? And then you've got a real good working relationship with the work workforce. Group. Yes, sir. And so there's a lot of information that you have, that you get just from the visits that you, that, about what jobs are coming and who's going to be looking for what. And it's very important to be able to tra translate that information or push that information to be able to mm -hmm. let the decision makers at the state recognize what, I'm going to say what jobs or what, what training should be funded in order to be able to fill those jobs. But it's also important, on, I'm going to say further down the road, is to be able to go, we talked about communication as one of our strategic goals, and th being able to have our team like uh, Gracie's team, her staff, that goes down and tries to get people involved in the dual credit program and be able to do what they can in high school so that they come in better prepared to college and to better prepared to be able to, to excel at the different yes, program offerings that we have for them to also know what opportunities there are. We could also, I think, go a little further in being able to tweak the message that we take down to the high school levels. I mean, particularly if they said, well, we need welders, but we also need heavy equipment operators, and we've got capacity to be able to fill 
that we, that, we, that we can utilize in our, in our programs to train heavy equipment. And so some students may say, well, heck, I, hadn't, I didn't know that you did that. That might be something I might be, be interested in doing. And again, you can go down, you can say, well, we have a great nursing program. We, but our nursing program is, is filled all the time, all the all capacity we have. That also goes for dental uh, <laughs> assistance. And, and, and some of the other programs that we have. So if we could figure out a way to take the, pro, the information that you, that you have, that you're getting, gaining at that level, and then be able to pitch it to the state about including those as the high uh, demand programs, and then going down in those areas where we have capacity that we're not filling, get the interest, cultivate the interest in the high school students, maybe even the, down at some point to the middle school students so that they can start looking at those opportunities to be able to, to enter the workforce, get the training they need, and then enter the workforce and, and meet the needs that we're going to have going forward. And I just a thought. Yeah. Thank you very much. That exposure and that alignment is going to be key. It, it really is critical for the students. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, Regents, thank you for your interest in this. We, we, I know it was a long morning, but we felt it was important as, as uh, the strategic planning team is looking at KPIs that we understand what House Bill 8 is, is measuring because you'll see a lot of overlap and, and consistency uh, in our, our next report on the strategic plan. Uh, the board is going to go into closed session um, and we will, board members will give you a, a little bit of a break and grab lunch and then we'll go into the closed session room. Uh, let me read the language uh, and then we'll come back out right before one o'clock and, and we will adjourn this meeting and, and uh, uh, convene the next meeting. But the board will go into closed session under Texas Government Code 551.071, consultation with legal counsel, Texas Government Code 551.087, deliberation regarding economic development, and Texas Government Code 551.074A1 regarding personnel matters, uh, and the time is 12.26 p.m. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to call this meeting of the Del Mar College, oops, excuse me. We need to adjourn our previous meeting at, uh, our workshop meeting was adjourned at 1.03 p.m.